Okay, so for this next part of this video, we're going to have to brush up on some remedial trigonometry. Uh, and to the extent that you need to understand uh, sine and inverse sine. Now, the reason why this is important is anybody who has needed to cut an angle, uh, you can either use like a, a preset angle, uh, like angle gauge blocks or... Uh, you know, a protractor or whatnot. But when you get into really precision machining of angles, uh, you need to use a sign block or a sign bar or, you know, it, there's a whole plethora of tools out there that use the sign principle to machine a precision angle. So getting back to remedial geometry, uh, let's say you have a sign bar. Let me grab mine, I'll show you. So this is a sign bar. This is a five inch, or excuse me, this is a six inch sign bar. But the important thing to note is that the distance between the two rolls, these two pins right here, is five inches. Uh, and sign bars or sign plates or whatnot commonly come in five or ten inch uh, lengths. And Machinery's Handbook actually has uh, sign tables for, I believe, ten inch bars listed. I haven't looked it up in a while, but I remember they had sign tables. So when you're machining a precision angle, what you do is you build up a gauge block stack. And the first place you start is by running the dimension that you want through uh, the sine function. So you take the sine of the angle you want, and that gives you the rise of uh, per inch or per increment, per any, you know, dimension. In this case, we're going to be talking inches. Now, going back to rise, uh, if we go back to, you know, high school math, uh, or for that matter, if you're in the trades, such as, uh, you know, the building trades, um, they refer to, well, angles are measured sometimes as rise over run. So you've got, uh, let's say, you write this down here. So you've got a 412 pitch. So that's a pitch. And you can simplify that down, which is what you would do typically in uh, proper mathematics. But in the trades, such as house building, when you describe a roof pitch, it's in rise over run. So for every 4 inch or for every 12 inches, the, the roof... Uh, you know, spans, it will rise four inches. And sometimes, uh, you know, you know, maybe 312, 412, whatnot. Uh, plumbing is the same way. So you've got waste plumbing, and your waste line needs to have a certain amount of drop to it in order for the liquid to flow downhill. Because you know what they say flows downhill. Uh, well, on plumbing, the rule of thumb, well, even on decks. So when you're dealing with plumbing or you're dealing with decks, you should have a certain amount of pitch to it. That pitch is one quarter inch per foot. Well, there's just something that so happens to be interesting in this. It's an aside, but uh, one quarter inch per foot is uh, a pitch change of 20.8 thousandths. Well, 1.2 degrees just happens to be just about a quarter inch per foot. Uh, the original Fidal tables that we're discussing here, I'm told the gib pitch is actually specified as one quarter inch per foot. The specification is approximately, it's 1.2 degrees plus or minus 0.1 degrees. And we'll get into that in a second, why the tolerance of plus or minus 0.1 degrees is not appropriate. So, back to our high school remedial math here. Sine of a number equals the rise, and then all you have to do is multiply it by your run. So, if you have a 5-inch sine bar, you say, I want to multiply 0 0.02094 times 5 inches, and I'll do the math here. So, 1.2 
times 5. That comes out to a gauge stack of 0 0.1047. Now I'm only resolving this out to four decimal places because gauge blocks only come out to tenths. So if I have a gauge stack of ten thousandths, uh, then I need to be able to make up a difference of 104.7 thousandths. Um, the way I did that, and I'll explain in a later video, is I used a 104 thou stack and I used a uh, 100.7 thou. So 0 0.10007 and a 0 0.1040 stack ends up being 204.7 thousandths. And then I used a 100 thousandths stack on the other side to get a difference of 104.7 thousandths. I know some people don't like how I say decimals, but this is the way I say decimals. So back to this. So we're talking about a sign bar. You got a five inch sign bar, your rise is 1.2 degrees, and that difference is 104.7 thousandths over five inches. Well, we can actually do all of this in reverse. What we can do is we can take an angle, we can put a gauge block of a known length on the angle, and then we can stick a pin at either end of that gauge block, and we can measure the thickness of the gib. And the difference in thickness between the thick end and the thin end is going to be our change over, you know, it's going to be our change or our, our rise over the run. And we can simplify that by dividing it down to the run and getting just this number right here, the change per inch or the rise per inch or change in angle per inch. So that brings me over to uh, this next side right here. I already worked out all the numbers ahead of time, but let's uh, let's show you the actual process. And for that, we need to pan down. Okay, so what I have here, I have two micrometers, and it's necessary because the thickness of this gib is over 500 thousandths on this side, and my pen is 501 thousandths. So what you need... Oh, now I know why. I got those numbers wrong right there. Uh, well, I'll do it with you on camera because I messed up. I forgot that I changed my gauge block length. Uh, so what you need is you need a gauge block of a known length. This is a 3-inch gauge block, and I've clamped it to the gib. And it's important that you clamp it down so that it doesn't move around. It needs to stay stationary while you're actually measuring it. The first step is, and this is little bit difficult with the camera in the way so let me go to the other side I've got a little more room over here I might be bumping the camera so you just have to tolerate that so what you do is you put your you have a gauge block of a known length you have a pin of a known diameter this is a gauge pin 501 thousandths you put that up against the edge of the block there hey, it's even measured 5010 on the block on the pin uh, or indicated so then what I do is I take a micrometer and I line it up over the center of the pin and then I wiggle it until I get what I consider a satisfactory reading. And this is a little fiddly. It was a lot easier whenever I did it uh, before because I didn't have the camera in the way. Okay, so we're reading at uh, just about uh, 1 inch 13 thousandths. So, as I messed up the stuff before, I'm going to redo the measurements on camera here. So, I'm going to write this down, 1013. And then I take the pin to the other side of the gauge block. Gauge block hasn't moved. I take my micrometer, open it up. I don't know if anybody else noticed, but the fact that this is not knurled right here is kind of a pain in the butt, you know? Like Tom said, I don't have the longest fingers in the world. Come on. Quit being so frustrating. Okay, so we got here, centered over the pin, 
it's important that you center it over the pin so that you get uh, the same measurement. Now the reason why I'm using a round pin is that the faces of the micrometer are parallel but the surfaces I'm measuring aren't. So I need to account for the angular misalignment on one of the anvils or the other, one of the measuring surfaces, and I do that by using a round pin because the pin doesn't care. It does introduce a very slight geometric error, but I'm not going to go into that too much. So we're looking at 941. I'm going to say that's probably like 941.2 or 941.3. Uh, we're at 941.3. So let me record that measurement. And now we're just about to do our math. Let me pay you back up. Well, uh, let me go into a little bit more detail. So the reason why we're using this gauge block of a known length is that we need to get two measurements that we have a known distance apart for. Uh, because we need that run and we need to measure the rise. We need to be able to create a number that is that's a representation of the difference between this end and this end. So we take this measurement, subtract this measurement, and we get a difference. And that difference is over the run. In this case, you have to add the length of the gauge block and the diameter of the pin. So this measurement is going to be 3.501. The reason why we're only measuring or adding the pin once is that we put it on this side, we're effectively taking half of the pin away. We put it on this side, we're taking the other half of the pin of the way. We add half and half and we get a hole, so they cancel out and we have gauge block length plus pin diameter equals the run. And then we just measure the rise in two places. Believe it or not, this is a very, very precise way of measuring an angle, and I'll explain that. Uh, you know, I'll give you a teaser on the next video. Whenever I remachined the Gibbs to fit the machine on my Bridgeport, I measured the angle and it was within 50 millionths per inch. So that's pretty darn tootin' close. That was good enough for me. Um, so now let's pan back up to the whiteboard. You can see the figures on the whiteboard have changed a little bit because I recognized my error. So, let's, uh, let's go over these figures. Right here, this is the thick end of the gib. That's that end. This is the thin end of the gib. And this is not quite the difference. Let me just double check. They might have canceled out because of thermal growth. 1.0 minus 0 0.9413. Oh, 007. Yeah, they're off by a tenth because of thermal growth. Because I've been handling things. It's cold in the garage today. It's kind of chilly. It's been, I think it was like 4 degrees last night. 0.717. So. We've measured to the tenth. Now we've calculated that difference. Now to get a figure that is the change, the deviation, the delta per inch, we have to divide the difference by the length of that gauge stack up. So we subtract, or excuse me, divide by 3.501. And what we get is a difference of point two zero four seven nine that's close enough uh, I'll end up running the number in the calculator so all the way we kind of we're circling the loop here we've talked about high school remedial geometry trigonometry whatnot how it applies to a sign bar how to calculate a an angle or a gauge block stack on a sign bar We've talked about rise and run. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take this number right here, we're going to turn it back into an angle. So, there is a function on your calculator that looks like this. It 
sine to the negative 1. And that's called the inverse sine function. Now, if we plug this number into the inverse sine function, then we're going to get an angle out of it, just like magic. So if I do inverse sine of my answer, I get 1.17349. That is the angle of the gib. Now, this is a used gib. It was in the machine for 30 years, and you can see that the angle has changed a bit. It's not 1.2 or 1.203 or anything really close. I mean, it's within three, you know, uh, three hundredths of an angle, uh, of a degree, excuse me. Now, I'm not going to convert that into minutes, minutes, you know, let's see, minutes, seconds, yeah, anyway. Degrees, minutes, seconds, yeah. I'm not going to convert that into degrees, minutes, seconds. Uh, but the point being is that we've taken some measurements with a gauge block and a gauge pin using micrometers. We figured out the difference in those measurements, divided them by the run, the stack up of the gauge pin and the gauge block. We've gotten our uh, rise or our change per inch and then we've run that through the inverse sine function and we measured, we were able to convert that into an angle that we're able to compare to a drawing or a specification. And now we've got a known quantity, we've been able to measure the angle. So the reason why this is important, and this comes to my next video, this angle right here, it changed. Fidal actually used to make, uh, so, there are two different sets of gibs. There's a gib that you don't see under here that connects the saddle to the base, and then there's a gib that connects the table to the saddle. This angle on my machine is 1.2 degrees, and I use this exact same method to measure the actual table. What I did is I clamped a gauge block to the outside of the table, and then I measured on the gauge pin, or excuse me, I clamped the gauge block to the inside of the table, then I used the gauge pin here and the gauge pin here, and I measured the thickness change in the table itself, and I was able to arrive at what the machined uh, angle is on the table, and then compare that. Hey, sorry if this is a little bit uh, you know, disjointed. Uh, my camera phone told me in a most uh, unflattering way that I'm long-winded. So, uh, just to sort of finish things up, uh, using the inverse sine function with the calculations that we, or the measurements we made, we were able to calculate the angle of the gib, and then based on uh, that process, we're able to measure the table, calculate what that gib angle is, and then we're able to use that to machine our own gibs from stock gibs because Fidal changed the angle from point uh, from 1.2 degrees to 0.95 degrees. And if you look here, you can see just how big of a difference that is. One of them, 1.2 degrees, is a change of 20.9 thousandths over an inch, and 0.95 is uh, 16 and a half thou over one inch. Now, when you multiply that over nine inches, uh, you can tell that gets to be pretty significant. Um, so let's just do a quick number. So 0 0.02094 minus 0 0.016657. That's a difference of 4 thou per inch times 9 inches. That's uh, almost 1 millimeter difference, 39.33 thousandths over 9 inches. So the gibs that I bought wouldn't fit, so I had to measure it and machine them myself. So anyway, hopefully I can edit this together in some coherent fashion. Thanks for watching. Bye.